All right, great scene. Look at Psalm 19, verse 11. I'm not really going to be preaching on from this psalm, but I just want to pull out one verse there in verse number 11. It says, we're, obviously, we're singing here, we're reading about the word of God, how it's sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. And then verse number 11, it says, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Great reward. We've been going through this series on rightly dividing the Bible, and the topic that I want to cover tonight is uh, gifts and rewards. Gifts and rewards. What are the differences between a gift that we read about in the Bible and rewards? And this is a very basic teaching. I know that a lot of you are going to understand the fundamentals of this. Um, nevertheless, you know, there are Christians out there that get these two things confused. Okay? When we talk about salvation, we talk about a free gift that's been given to us by Jesus Christ. But there are a number of Christians, so-called Christians out there, that name the name of Christ, and they believe their salvation is based on reward. If I do, God will be merciful to me, and I will be saved, or something along those lines. And so we want to understand the difference between gifts and rewards. And sometimes when we preach about the topic of rewards, it sometimes is quite vague. I want to uh, give you some rewards, some very uh, um, clear re rewards that we can read about in the Bible, so you can be working toward those things. And if you're not able to work toward those, you know, you're not working toward those things, start applying certain principles in your life so you can start working toward these rewards. Now, there are some rewards that you're just not going to know about. You know, it just comes down to serving the Lord, doing the best you can for the Lord. But there are other things that are very clear for us in the Bible. And those things we need to know about, we want to see what God says about how we can try to earn a full reward for our Christian life. So what's the difference between a gift and a gift? And a reward. Let me just give you the, uh, the, the dictionary definition first of all. So when it comes to a gift, it is something given to another voluntarily without charge. Voluntarily without charge. When something's without charge, what are we saying? It's free. Okay, it's without charge, it's free, and it's given to them. A reward is something of value given in return for an act. So you give someone a reward when someone's done an act, they've done well at something, and you've rewarded them for the work that they've done. But a gift is not based on your act. A gift is voluntarily, without charge, free. Okay, free. Now, what I want you to first uh, begin by going, going to James chapter 1, please. Go to James chapter 1 in your Bible, and the Bible gives us a really great definition of what a gift is. Again, we want to separate gifts from rewards, okay, when it comes to, especially when it comes to salvation. But let's go to James chapter 1, verse 17. James chapter 1, verse 17. The Bible says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Do you notice that it says here, it talks about the gift of God. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. It comes from the Father of lights. It comes from God the Father. But notice what it says about God the Father here. When he bestows these gifts to every man, it says that he gives a, sorry, about him with whom is no variableness. Okay? So the gift that God offers, there's no variableness. There's no difference in the gift that's been given. It's the same gift that is being offered unto every man. Every man, woman, and child no matter what your background is, no matter what your religious background is or what you've done in your life, how sinful you are, there is no variableness with God. When it comes to every perfect gift from above, it's the same gift available to all. Not only is there no variableness in the gift, it says here, neither shadow of turning. Not even, you know, when you move, you might have a shadow, and often when you, when, if you make a small move, your shadow will move even more so. Because there's a distance from your body. So you move a little bit, your shadow moves a lot more. Not even the shadow of God turns or moves when it comes to his every perfect and good gift. Now this, when you read about this in the context of the next verse, this is about salvation. Look at verse number 18. Of his own will beget us, sorry, of his own will beget he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So when it comes to being begotten of God, being born of God, being born again, that's, that's, we're born again by the word of truth. And it's that salvation, it's that born again experience that we can go through that is being uh, referred to here as that every good and perfect gift. 
There is no variableness. It's the same way. For anybody to be saved, it's the same way. It's an offer made through Jesus Christ, being born again by faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the idea here, guys, is, you know, when it comes to giving a birthday gift, often we give gifts on birthdays, don't we? But it it doesn't matter if that child, let's say, you know, you give a child a birthday gift, it doesn't matter if they've been really well behaved, if they've done extra well in, in, in that year of life. The simple fact is, they're turning another year old, you know, we sit down, we celebrate their birthday, and we get, often give them gifts, regardless of how well they sort of behaved as a child on their birthday, because we're not celebrating how well they behaved. We're celebrating the fact that they were born, okay? When it came to their birth, they did no work. Mother did all the work. She pushed that little baby out. The baby just had to squeeze through, right? Well, once the mother pushes through, she does all the work, she does all the labor, and the baby then is born. When it comes to being born again of your salvation, it's not your work, okay? And that's why the, the, every good, you know, the, the gifts, there is no variableness. It's all the work has been done by Jesus Christ on the cross. When he took all your sins upon himself, he died for you, rose again three days later, and God has given you that free gift. There is no variableness. It's the same gift to everybody. It's the same gift to everybody. Now, what I want you to do, please, is go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Uh, I'll get you to turn there while I read to you from Ephesians 2.8. We know these verses very well. Okay, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Look, at, pay attention now. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when it comes to salvation as a gift of God, God makes it very clear that it's not of works, that it's not of yourselves, because gifts are free, okay? The the work that's been uh, done was done in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible is very clear that we're saved by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. You see, when you start working for something, it's no longer a gift. When you start working for something, now you're asking God for a reward. Do you want to really face the Lord on Judgment Day and say, Lord, well, you know, I deserve my reward of salvation because look how I worked for you? Man, you're going to come up short if that's what you're trusting in. You're better off just receiving that free gift, that perfect gift from above that comes from the Father of lights. You guys are in Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, again, these passages you're all very familiar with. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? So, let me backtrack a little bit. When I read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, when I read to you, for by grace that you say through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What is the gift? Some people, especially if you come from a Calvinistic uh, theology, they understand, they view the gift as faith. They'll, they'll read it this way, for by grace that you say through faith, faith is the gift. Because in their failed theology, they believe that God has chosen some to be saved and God has chosen some to be damned. Hey, I thought the gift of God had no variableness. I thought it was the same to everybody. I thought there was no shadow of turning. Well, when it comes to Calvinism, when it comes to being saved by the gift, there is a difference. There is variation according to Calvinism. This is why it's a false religion. This is why it's a false way, a false gospel. Is because it, it doesn't understand the concept of a gift. How can faith be the gift? That's a, look, if, for those that, well, look up my parents here, for some of you guys that know Spanish, the word grace, for by grace, say, what, does, what does grace mean? For by grace, it's unmerited favor. Grace is unmerited favor. If I'm showing grace towards you, I'm showing you unmerited favor. I'm giving you more than you deserve. Look, this is the same thing, unmerited favor. Unmerited means it's a gift. It's free, okay? In Spanish, we have the word gratis, which means, what does it mean, gratis? Free, okay? And that's where you get the word grace from. Grace, gratis, is free. And so when we read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace, that's what's free. What's free? The gift. For by grace, are you say, through faith. It, that, that not itself, it is the gift of God. What is the gift? The grace. The grace which offers us salvation, and we receive that salvation through faith, by believing on the gospel. 
And this confirms for us again here in Romans 6.23, but the gift of God is eternal life. It doesn't say the gift of God is faith. It says, no, it's eternal life. It is the grace, it is the salvation that is the gift of God. How do we receive it? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the one that did all the work. And for us, it is gratis, it is grace, it is free, okay? Go to Romans chapter 11, verse 5, please. Romans chapter 11, verse 5. And some, look, this, you need to get this down. If you cannot understand this, I fear for your soul. If you cannot understand this simple concept that salvation is a free gift, I, I worry about you, and you need to get this down. You need to understand. Romans 11, verse 5. Even so then at this present time, also there's a remnant a, according to the election of grace. Again, what's grace? Free, Okay. And if by grace or unmerited favor, look at this, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Listen, salvation is either by grace or it's by work. Okay? And it's up to you. You can decide how you want to be saved. Okay? You either receive the, the free grace of God, which is the gift, not of works, a gift, or you go for the works. And if you go for the works, so on this side, it is no more grace. It is no more God offering you salvation. You've got to try your best to work your way to heaven, and you're never going to do it. You're never going to accomplish it. You cannot mix these two things, is what this Bible is telling, the Bible is telling us here. It's either grace, all grace. It's either all free, a free gift, or it's either all works over here. You've got to choose which one you want to decide on. You know, and, and please... If you think, well, no, it is by grace. It is by grace through faith, but you've got to have the works, otherwise you're not saved. Well, now you're mixing those two things. The Bible says very clearly, if you make it of works, it's no more of grace. And if it's grace, it's not of works. You've got to decide which salvation you have, what kind of gospel you have. Is it the one that is by a gift? All right? Keep, let's keep reading there. Let's go to, actually, go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. It's grace or it's work, it cannot be both. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, this speaking of Adam, who sinned, and by his, uh, by his sin, we're all born to condemnation, okay? And then it says here, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift... Just to make it very clear, just in case you don't think, you, you don't realize that gifts are free, God makes it very clear here, free gift, okay, came upon all men unto justification of life. Who do you think is the one that brought righteousness there? We're talking about Adam who brought condemnation to man, who brought righteousness? Jesus Christ, okay? And notice that it said in verse number 18 that the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. It's not that God chose some and didn't choose others to be saved. No, it's been made available to all, all. Okay, but look at verse number 19. Do all get saved? For as by one man's disobedient, but disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, that is the obedience of Jesus, shall many be made righteous. So it's not all, but many. Many are made righteous. Many believe in him and are saved. Many receive the free gift. Verse number 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace much more abound that as sin have reigned unto death even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by jesus christ our lord listen verse number 20 is is ex is great news for everybody moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abounded grace did much more abound you see you can continue a life of sin oh i can't believe you said that well you could you could just continue a life of sin. And even if you just live that life of sin, even if you are bounded in sin, guess what abounds more than your sins? God's grace. God's free gift abounds more than any sin you can do. Okay? Because Jesus Christ came and died for all your sins, your past, present, and future sins. Okay? This is why you can't mix these two things up. You cannot come over here and say, well, you've got to repent of your sins. Why? That is work. All right? What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. If I'm breaking God's law and you're telling me turn from your sins, 
Now you're asking me, keep God's law. The Bible calls that the works of the law. No, works is separate from God's grace. Make sure you understand this. Make sure you receive the proper gift. Make sure you're not trusting in a reward, okay? Because your reward will never get you to heaven. It's only the free gift of salvation by Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4, please. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Now, we've looked at these passages numerous times, but let's remind ourselves. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, now look at this. We're talking about the difference between gifts and rewards, okay? Verse number four. Now to him that worketh, if you want to go to heaven because of your works, what's it say here? Now to him that worketh is the reward. Is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. What the Bible's saying here is you're, if you're trying to be saved by keeping the works of the law, okay, you're trying to do the works, well then God owes you a debt because you're, you're, you're working your way. To, you're trying to work your way to heaven. And it's no longer a gift, is it? What's it called? A reward. Rewards are, are different to gifts. And it's a reward not reckoned of grace. Not reckoned of grace. Understand this. It's God's grace over here that gives us salvation. You're trying to work your way and earn the rewards. Well, it's not of grace. You're not going to get saved. Okay? You're not going to get your, the unmerited favor of the Lord, the free gift, by working over here. Okay? Yes, God's going to owe you, but it's not going to be enough to get you saved. Because you're not perfect, okay? You're still a sinner. You're still a filthy sinner. Verse number five. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Let's make that very clear. But to him that worketh not, how do you get saved? By faith and you've got to have the works? No, to him that worketh not. You've got to be all the way over here understanding the free gift of salvation, receiving it for free, okay? That's how you get saved. He that worketh not. There are too many, too many Christians today that mix these two things. Yes, I want the free gift, but you got to have the work so you're not saved. To him that worketh not, the Bible says. Not. You understand that? Don't work for salvation. Don't trust your works for salvation. Only the gift that's been given to us by Jesus Christ. So let's talk about rewards now. Let's talk about rewards. And if you guys can go to Psalm 19, this is where we were reading from originally, Psalm 19. And uh, while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from the book of Ruth. This is probably a, not, a, not a very common book we will turn to, but I, it has a really great definition of the word reward, okay? Because I do believe we should be striving once you receive the free gift, once you know it's by the grace of God, you know it's just by faith, yeah, now you're saved. Now what should you do? Should you just continue being over here? No, the Lord now wants you to start working for his kingdom. Start working for his namesake. You now start earning rewards. And the Bible gives us a definition in Ruth chapter 2 verse 12. The Lord recompense, look at this. The Lord recompense thy work with a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. So this is Boaz speaking to Ruth, and uh, he says, look, the Lord's going to recompense your work. He's going to give you a full reward. So when it comes to reward, it's work. You work, and God wants to give us rewards. But this has nothing to do with salvation. This has everything to do with just living a life that pleases to Lord, the Lord, having eternity as your mindset rather than the temple things of this world. You guys are in Psalm 19, verse 11. Psalm 19, verse 11. Moreover, by them, the words of God, the Bible, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Does God want us to have great rewards? Absolutely. He's given us His Bible. He's given us the Scriptures that we would keep them, that we would walk according to their paths so we can earn rewards. We earn rewards. Again, nothing to do with salvation. Please understand. Work and reward has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is grace, free gift, not of works, by faith. Okay? Keep those two things separate. Never mix them. The Bible never mixes them. You don't mix them. Otherwise, you've got a false gospel. Okay? Go to Proverbs. Where can I get to turn? Yeah, go to Proverbs 11, please. Proverbs 11, verse 18. 
And while you're turning, I'm going to read, so Proverbs 11, 18, go there. I'm going to read to you from Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. The Bible says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. A good reward for their labor. So we've seen how the Bible uses the term reward by your work, by your labor, the things you do for the Lord. You guys are in Proverbs 11, verse 18. The Bible says, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Hey, you want to get rewards in heaven? You want to have a sure reward? You've got to sow righteousness. You've got to do that which is right according to God's word. That's how you can earn rewards in heaven. Now, let me, uh, let me explain this. Let me just break this down a little bit more. A lot of Christians just have not been taught by their pastors, have not been taught in their churches that there are rewards to be earned, okay? They think, well, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. That's sufficient reward, they'll think. Well, it's not a reward, it's a gift. You didn't have to do anything except believe on Christ, all right? That's just step number one. Now you're, in, now you, you're, you're eternally going to be in heaven. You've got eternal life. Now what? Now you start working for rewards. And some people don't like this. I'll tell you why they don't like it. Because they know they haven't done any work for God. And they're thinking, man, I'm going to get to heaven and I'm not going to have much. Now look, if you're saved, praise God. Right? Praise God. You've got Jesus Christ as your foundation. You're going to be in heaven regardless, okay? But here's the thing. I don't want to just make it to heaven. I want to be in heaven and I want to be able to see the rewards that I've worked for the Lord and for the Lord to smile upon me and say, hey, thou good and faithful servants. That's what I want from the Lord. Is that what you want? I don't want to just say, well, good work, you believed on Jesus. That's good, all right? But I want him to know that I've done more to, to try to strive and to live after his ways, to, to sow to righteousness, earn those rewards. And we need to know about this. Again, heaven is not communism. We don't all get a fair share, okay? It's capitalism. You start working now. You start earning rewards in heaven. You lay up treasures in heaven today. Now's your opportunity till the day you die. If you don't do it today, when you get to heaven, you're going to be thankful you're there for, for Jesus Christ, but you're going to regret all the time you had on the earth to not earn those rewards, okay? Now, I don't want to talk vague. I, I do want to get to a point where we can understand what some of these rewards are. We can start working toward these things. And uh, let me just give you some advice how we can start earning rewards, just, just, a, just some, con uh, some high-level concepts. Number one, when you work for the Lord, don't do it to be praised by men. Okay, that's point number one. Don't do works to be praised by men. Matthew 6, 1, Jesus says, Take heed that you do not your arms, those are good works, before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward. Listen to this. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. If you just do good works to praise to be seen of men, wow, look how good of a Christian you are. If that's what you like and you want the pat on the back and you want everyone to know how good you are, well, that's your reward. Your reward is people patting you on the back. But you're not going to be rewarded by your Father in heaven. You're not going to have eternal rewards in heaven. I mean, look, we've probably all done, look, all of us have pride. All of us like to be patted on the back a little bit. I'm sure we've all, at some point, have done work, thinking we're doing it for the Lord, but we really were kind of seeking just to praise the men a little bit. Well, those rewards, they're gone, okay? We need to make sure we have the right mindset we're doing to serve the Lord. We're not doing it to be seen of men. Now, if you're seen of men, they praise you, praise God, but make sure that's not your motive, okay, is what I'm trying to say. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about, just very quickly, in Matthew 10, 40, maybe you want to turn there, Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, please, Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, and this is probably the most, the, the easiest, the most common way to earn rewards on this earth, and this has to do with how we serve one another, okay? Matthew chapter 10, verse 40, the Bible says, He that receiveth you, this is Jesus speaking to his soul winners, He that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Did you know if I receive one of my brothers in the Lord here? You know, we have a visitor here from the US. You know, if, if, you, if you stop, this is a brother in Christ, you stop by and you receive him, you welcome him, you be hospitable toward him, guess who else you're receiving? Jesus Christ. You know, if you receive Christ, guess who else you're receiving? The Father, okay? The Bible says here, verse number 41, He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. 
Man, we're talking about rewards. How do we earn rewards? Just by being hospitable, just by being friendly, just by being loving toward the brethren in the church, just by being loving by the, to the brethren that we meet out and about. Verse number 42, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of the disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Just a cup of water to a disciple, to a child. God says, you're not going to lose your rewards. You're going to be given rewards just for serving the brethren, just for serving the little children in the church. You know, sometimes we think of children as a, as a hassle. You know, they're loud. They're, oh, why should I serve them? They're little. But if you serve them, God says, hey, you're going to have a reward in heaven. Okay. Well, what, what a blessing to know that if I just serve my brethren, even though I know your faults, you know my faults, sometimes we might clash. We might not always get along. Hey, but if we show love toward one another, we, we show servitude toward one another, we are doing that as unto the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to God the Father, and we're not going to lose our rewards. All right. Now you go to Matthew chapter 16. Go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Again, a lot of Christians don't like this idea of rewards. They don't like the idea that some Christians are going to get more than others. But here's the thing. I mean, we usually love the idea. Like, if, if, I, if I'm an employer and I've got two employees, one guy works super hard. You know, he puts in the hours. He never, you know, he's, he's always working hard. He's not lazy. And then I've got another employee who's lazy, who gets to, gets to work late, you know, try, you know, gets home as quickly as he can, doesn't, doesn't really want to go above and beyond. Who do you think I'm going to give the pay increase to? Who do you think is the one that I want to give the bonus when the business does well? It's going to be the hardworking employee. I mean, this is just logical. We, we like this idea. We like the idea of you work hard, you get what deserves to. You're a lazy bum, you get nothing. Well, guess what? It's no different in heaven. God, the more work you do for the Lord, the greater your rewards. Otherwise, you can be saved. Great. And you can be a lazy bum, but you're not going to get anything in heaven. You're not going to get any rewards. Jesus Christ speaks about this over and over again. Look at Matthew 16, verse 27. Speaking of His second coming, the Bible says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels. You say, wow, we're going to glorify God. But look at this. And then He shall reward every man according to His works. Jesus Christ is coming in power, in glory. It's going to blow us away. But He says, I want to give you rewards. That's what I come for. I want to, I want to come and give you my servants, you workers, those that have been serving me. I want to come and give you rewards. But look at this. He shall reward every man according to what? According to his works. The more works you do for the Lord, the more rewards you're going to get. Is this about salvation? Every man according to his works. No, because works is over here. Salvation is without works. Okay? Salvation is that free gift. The difference between the gifts, which is free, and the reward, which we work for once we are saved. Okay? Once we understand, you cannot be saved over here. Okay, no, 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 you're saved over here by the free gift available to us by Jesus. Once you have the free gift, now you should be striving to earn those rewards in heaven. Jesus wants to come and give you rewards, all right? Now, let's talk about five rewards that I want you to think about. And these five rewards are known as crowns in the New Testament, crowns, okay? And uh, again, it's many times these rewards are vague, but these crowns are very specific. And it has a lot to do with how we live our Christian life. So please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. I've got five crowns here. I think it's pretty common. Most people recognize these five crowns as they read through the New Testament. Five crowns that Jesus Christ wants us to strive for. And these crowns are rewards, okay? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. So Paul is telling us, I want you to get into the race and run. Now he's going to speak about the incorruptible crown. This is crown number one, the incorruptible crown. And the way you receive this crown the way you obtain this crown, number one, you've got to get into the race. You've got to start running. It's not just about sitting down in church. No, you've got to start living for the Lord. You need to start putting His will in your life. Start running the race that is set before you. Look at verse number 25. And every man that striveth, so it requires work, striving. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. 
we've, we've gone for the fruits of the Spirit, the temperate being one of those, that's been well balanced as a Christian, loving the things that God loves, hating the things that God hates, being temperate in accordance to God's Word, temperate in all things. Now they do it, to, now they do it that's the world, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, because, you know, they, they earn their, their, their trophies, they earn their gold medals, but it's corruptible, it's all going to fall apart. But look at, look at, 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 the, at the end of verse 25, but we and incorruptible. The rewards we're working for are incorruptible. They're going, to be, they're going to last forever. Verse number 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Paul says, look, I'm, I'm in this spiritual fight. I'm in this spiritual race. I'm in this spiritual boxing match because I expect to win. Okay? It's not, I have no uncertainty. He knows that there's a reward to be earned. Look at verse number 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so, what I wanted to show you there was this incorruptible crown. Verse number 25, the world is seeking a corruptible crown, but we are seeking an incorruptible, an incorruptible crown. How do we obtain it? We participate in the race, we run the race, we develop temperance in our lives, being biblically balanced in our lifestyle, and then we put our body, that's the flesh, into subjection. How do we put the flesh, you know, the carnal body, the, the one that seeks to please itself, the one that seeks to sin, we put that under subjection to the new man, of course, the new man, you know, making efforts to overcome sin. Should we strive to work on overcoming sin, turning from sin? Absolutely. We should strive to do that. We should strive to put our, our bodies, our flesh, under subjection, under that new man. That's work. It's all work over here, okay? And if you're able to accomplish this, you're able to have great success of this in, in your life, Paul, Paul is expecting that he would get the incorruptible crown. I want you guys to start thinking about, well, what's the point? You know, why should I, why should I uh, try to, you know, uh, walk in the new man? Why should I crucify that old flesh? Well, here's why. Because there's an offer of an incorruptible crown, okay? For the works that you do, the incorruptible crown. That's crown number one. Please go to 2 Timothy now. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. So I want to, I want to show you what the Bible says, how we obtain these things, you know? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. The second crown that we see here in the Bible is the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. This is Paul talking about now is toward the end of his life. And the time of my departure is at hand. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So we see that same kind of idea we're there with the incorruptible crown. But then he says, verse number 8. Henceforth... There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. The crown of righteousness. How do we obtain this crown? It's given to those that love his appearing. Are you looking forward to the second coming of Christ? Are you looking for those new resurrected bodies when, the Christ, when Christ comes and He descends in the clouds and we're caught up together with the, uh, the believers that have gone before us, caught up with them together in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you looking forward to that day? Or are you saying, well, Lord, actually, I don't want it to come yet because I've got a lot to do in my life. You know, I want to experience what it's like to get married. I want to experience what it's like to have kids. I want to experience what it's like to have grandkids. I have, I have goals, Lord. I want to travel the world. You know, if that's your mindset, if you're saying, Lord, I'd rather do all these things and you delay your coming, you're not loving his appearing. You should be seeking to be someone that, hey, Lord, please come. What did Jesus say when he prayed the, the model prayer? He says, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy, na thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, said Jesus Christ. Christ was looking forward to the kingdom of God coming upon this earth. And he comes with his appearing. When he comes back the second time, he's going to set up his millennial kingdom. He's, we're going to be a rule and reign with Christ. That's how we seek. That's how we love his appearing. That's how we can attain this crown of righteousness. That's an easy one to attain. I want everybody in this church to have the crown of righteousness. If I see you in heaven and you haven't got the crown of righteousness, hey, what, you, what happened? <laughs> you didn't love his appearing? What's going on? Hey, this is an easy one that we should be striving to work toward, love in the appearing of Jesus Christ. Your heart should be on eternal matters, not on the temporal 
things that you can have on this earth. The new resurrected body, overcoming sin completely once we're uh, uh, raptured with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's crown number two, the crown of righteousness. Crown number one was the incorruptible crown. And now please go to James chapter one. James chapter one. This is, this is a very difficult crown. Okay, James chapter one, verse two. This is known as the crown of life. The crown of life. This is the third crown. And this one's a tough one. But James chapter one, verse two. James chapter one, verse two. The Bible says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And I've gone over this not long ago, but we looked at this reference of temptations as not being a temptation to sin, but a temptation when it comes to the trying of your faith, the trials, the tribulations that we go through in life, okay? The Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So we're being instructed, brethren, when you're going through difficulties, rejoice. Let it mature you. Let, it, let, it gain, let, let yourself gain experience and patience and be mature. Verse number five. And if any of you lack wisdom, that's so important. Because as we're going through trials, I know that I make this mistake many times. So if I make this mistake, you're going to make this mistake. Is I forget to ask God for wisdom. I'm like, why am I going through this trial? Why am I going through this difficulty? Oh, well, I don't know why. No, no. Verse number five. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. You see, the Lord wants you to know why you're going through trials. He wants to give you wisdom. He wants you to understand what he's trying to develop in your life. He wants you to be able to overcome those temptations, but that's going to come from the wisdom that comes from God if you ask of him. Verse number six, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth, wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now, we'll just skip down to verse number 12. Because look what it says here, verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So how do we get the crown of life? Number one, we've got to love him. We've got to love the Lord, right? It's a promise there to those that love him, but it's not just loving him. It's when we go through these trials, when we go through these temptations, that we endure it, that our faith comes out shining bright, okay? We don't get in a discouraged state. We don't get in a backslidden and like, oh God, why me? Why did you allow me to go through this difficulty? That's not going to earn you the crown of life. You've got to receive that crown of life and go through that temptation rejoicing. Okay, rejoicing, knowing that the Lord is allowing you to go through this. If, if anything, if you're going through difficulties and you just can't wrap your head around it, why God? Maybe he just wants to give you the opportunity to earn that crown. It's like, come on, you can do it. The crown of life is around the corner. You know, rejoice in the trial. Rejoice in the tribulation. You know, let it test you. Let it mature you. You know, come through and love the Lord through that challenge. And if you guys can go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. It mentions the crown of life again here. And again, it's the same idea. But it's a much harsher state, you know, for some Christians. You know, some Christians will lose their life for the Lord. You know, they will, be go, they will go through trials and difficulties and they'll just lose their life. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. That's a trial of your faith. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Wow. You know, th these Christians here that are being thrown into prison, they may very well die. For the, for the cause of Christ. They may very, very well die for the name of Christ, but if they go through it and they die for the Lord, God's, Jesus says, I'll give you the crown of life. You know, if you go through that difficulty, you go through that trial, you go rejoicing, you, you die in my name, crown of life automatically. You know, praise God. Now look, we may never have to give our life over like that, okay? But what we saw in James, it's all the trials, it's all the temptations, it's all the difficulties that we go through, through in life. We can use that as an opportunity, as a platform to obtain the crown of life. So how do we obtain it? We come through trials with patience, maturing, growing in experience. We gain wisdom from the Lord to go through that trial. Loving the Lord. Again, you may lose your life in the name of Christ, but the key thing was to go through the trial with gladness. If you're able to accomplish this through your difficulties, the crown of life is around the corner. Okay? I don't believe God just tells us this. With no he gives us these things so we can work toward it. I believe these crowns exist. I believe they're going to fit on some of our heads. Okay? 
and it's made especially for us. You know, God tells us about these great rewards and tells us how we can earn them. You know, please don't miss this in your spiritual growth. If you guys can go to 1 Peter chapter 5 now. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> and while you're turning, I'm going to read to you from Matthew 5.11. Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, you're blessed when people are lying about you. You're blessed when you're being persecuted. Why? Verse number 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. Man, if you're being persecuted for Christ, rejoice, he says. Rejoice. The, the prophets before you have been persecuted. And he says, look, great is your reward in heaven. Every time that Jesus Christ speak of these rewards, he wants us to work toward them. Right? This is what's going to get us through difficulties in life. When, when people are putting us down, when they're making fun of our faith, I'm just going to rejoice. I know there's more treasures in heaven for me. There's greater rewards in heaven for me when you go through that. But you guys are in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The fourth crown here is the crown of glory. The crown of glory. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Now, this is one that's not available to everybody. Okay? This is one that's available only to pastors. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders, and it's not just every pastor. Let's have a look at it, okay? There's already, there's conditions as well. The elders, and elders is the word that's used interchangeably with bishop or pastor. The elders which are among you, I exhort, whom am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partake of the glory that shall be revealed. Look at verse number two. This is how we get this crown. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Verse number three, neither as being lords of a God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. Verse number four, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory. There's the crown, the crown of glory that fadeth not away. So how do we obtain this crown, the crown of glory? Number one, you've got to be a pastor, okay? So if anyone has a desire to be a pastor one day, hey, there's a crown, okay? But not just being a pastor. You've got to be there, verse number two, someone that is feeding the flock of God, okay? You've got to put study into your preaching, okay? You've got to dig in deep. You've got to give people something they can work toward, you know? Feed, feed people the Bible, not just milk, but strong meat. You know, Christians need a good diet of all things, even milks from time to time, but the strong meat as well. That's why pastors need to study, spend time preaching God's Word, not just preaching God's word, but taking the oversight thereof. You know, looking at the congregation, make sure you tailor the preaching God's word to the church. You know, I, I don't care about some controversy that's going on on the other side of the world. I'd rather make sure when I get here behind the pulpit, I'm preaching something that's going to feed this church. It's going to feed you. I'm not going to get the crown for worrying about some controversy overseas. I'll get the crown for feeding this church, right? The oversight thereof, not, of, not by constraint, but willingly. It's something that you're willing to do, not a filthy lucre. You know, it's not something you take on for money. Man, if I do this job, I'm going to get this much money. No, that's not why. That's not, what, that's not going to earn you the crown of glory. Verse number three, neither has been lords over God's heritage. I'm not a lord over you, all right? I mean, I have rule in the house of God, all right? But when you leave the house of God, when you leave the church, I have no rule over you, okay? Husbands, dads, you've got the rule in your family. I'm not there to tell you how to live your lives. I'm not there to put unnecessary pressures and burdens upon you. That's not my job, but what's to say at the end of verse number three, but being in samples to the flock. That's, that's how I work, you know, I'm not just commanding you like a slave master. No, I should set a good example in my life, my family, my wife, my children, you know, my service for God. I always try to serve, a, put a good example forward so you can, you know, be encouraged and you can start working toward, you know, serving the Lord as well. If, if a pastor is able to accomplish these things, Jesus Christ, when he comes back, is going to give these good pastors a crown of glory. And let me just tell you, I want that crown, Okay. I don't want to be just a pastor. I want to be a pastor. Jesus says, you know what? You did good. Here's a crown of glory. Why not? All right? Why not? Because I'm doing it to serve this church, to serve the body, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about me. Okay? It's not about me. But I, hey, it's beautiful when Jesus Christ can recognize the work that you've done for him. Please go to 1 Thessalonians now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're on to the last crown here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And while the, the previous crown is not one that we can all attain, for the next one we definitely can, 
And before we read number five, let me just repeat what these five crowns were. Number one, the incorruptible crown. Number two, the crown of righteousness. Number three, the crown of life. Number four, the crown of glory. Number five, the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Paul says to the Thessalonian church, you are my crown of glory. The fact that you're saved. I was able to give you the gospel. You believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You received the free gift. That's my crown of glory. Praise God. We can all do this. You know, if you're able to get out there, give the gospel, we can all do it. We can all knock doors, preach the gospel, see people saved, lead them to Jesus Christ. They are, those people are your crown of glory. All right, so this is seeing souls saved, okay? It's not just how many salvations you do, but it's just doing the work. You know, talking to Brother Richard, you know, we're talking about how the Philippines and, and other places in the world is so receptive and how unreceptive it is here in Australia. But he's encouraged me to say, hey, you know, it's not always about the numbers, right? It's about doing the work, right? Doing the work, it's sowing the seed. Yes, it's harder here, but when I get someone saved here, I rejoice even more because I know how hard it is, all right? Praise God, we can all do it. If you please go to 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. I'm almost done now. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul writes here, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul says, look, I watered. I, I Sorry, yeah, I, I planted. You know, I, I was sowing the seed. But then Apollos came along later on and watered the grounds. And something came out of that. God gave the increase. Verse number 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And that's something we need to remember. When we see souls saved, we give the glory to the Lord, right? He is the one that gives the increase. Verse number eight. <clears throat> now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Look at this. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Listen, if all you're doing for a long time is just sowing the seed, planting, well, you're going to be rewarded for your labor, okay? It's not just the reaping. It's the sowing, it's the watering, okay? And the Sunshine Coast needs a lot of sowing. It needs a lot of watering, okay? We need to plow that ground pretty hard over here on the Sunshine Coast. But we're still laboring for the Lord. We're still working for the Lord. And these people that we speak to, these people that eventually get saved, guess what? They're going to be our crown of rejoicing. Now, I don't know whether there will be an actual crown on our heads for this one. Nevertheless, it's the people that we rejoice in heaven when we see them in heaven and they're able to turn around and say to you, hey, the reason I'm here is because, remember five years ago, you came into my house, you knocked on my door, you gave me the gospel, I believed on Jesus Christ. You're going to be rejoicing for all eternity for seeing this person say, they're going to be your crown. The people will be your crown. What an amazing thing. It's not just a piece of gold, but the actual people, a living reward, a living crown. So in conclusion, guys, the differences between the gifts and the rewards. When it comes to salvation, please don't forget, the gifts are free paid for by Jesus Christ. Not of works, very clear. But once you receive the gift, once you're saved, now you can stay here, you're going to be saved. You don't have to do the works, okay? But once you are saved and you want to serve the Lord, you want to earn those rewards, you start laboring for Him. You start doing the works. And I'll just read very quickly to you from Revelation 3.11. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Listen, don't let anybody take your crown. God has these crowns for us. He wants us to work for them, but men will stop us. This ungodly world will try to stop us. Unsaved family will try to stop us. Even Christians might try to stop us. But Jesus Christ says, don't let any man take this crown for you. He wants us to labor for those rewards, labor for those crowns. And I think if he's willing to wear the crown of thorns on his head, he's worthy of the work, okay? Because I'm not going to wear those crown of thorns, all right? But he's going to give me these great rewards because he was able to suffer for me. He's given me the ability, the new man to walk after, to earn those rewards in heaven. Let's pray.